somebody would raise their voice at me in my family's house, the nigga wouldn't make it out the door. Now he would make it to the basement. If you know what I mean, but he wouldn't make it out the door. <laughs> First, look, forgive me that I'm not dressed up in front of the camera. Forgive me. I'm tired. I had a four day work week, plus, on top of that, all my self employment uh, tasks that I had to take care of, including, you know, packing and shipping things for uptopbeauty.com and reading and editing the, the current book that we're on right now. Now, don't forget, guys, it's very important for us that we promote our book club. So please remember to go to uptopbeauty.com and grab our tote because we've been reading with Uptown Negro. Chain of Fools was right up our alley and in fact had been in our repertoire for years. We loved Aretha Franklin, but the feeling wasn't always mutual until he threw her over for me. You say what? Until he threw her over for me. Dennis Edwards and Aretha were an item and had even contemplated getting married. So Aretha was not my biggest fan. And for a few years, whenever we crossed paths, she was colder than Boston in December. Ooh, y'all, let me tell you something, okay? Listen, it's, what is it right now? I think it's 92 degrees, but it feel like 104 down here in Georgia. And my entire life, you hear me? My ent entire life. Of 52 years, I have never looked forward to cold weather until this year. You hear me? Like, I feel sorry for everybody's electric bill right now. This shit is a problem. I didn't take it personally, though. The inspiration that I've received from her since I was eight years old is enough for me. I love the lady, and I stand on her shoulders, as they say. If you love the ladies, why the hell did you let Dennis? I can see your dick print through your pants. Edwards, come to your house and smoke the crackers. You knew that she that he just left Riri to come over your house to smoke the crackers. Why did you do that? Nothing in your mind said. Well, I mean, it is Dennis Edwards, so. The session seemed to last but a nanosecond and was recorded and later aired on PBS. We got the song in a few takes. Rhythm, Country, and Blues was released by MCA Records on March 1st, 1994 and debuted at number one on the top country albums and number 15 on top R&B hip hop. Well, the album was an expected smash and went platinum our first since 1985 and chain of fools was nominated for a song of the year by the country music association another boost came when the william morris agency our booking agent set up a star for us on the hollywood walk of fame on september 29th 1994 pause did y'all know that cat williams paid the money i think it's like Twenty-five or seventy-five thousand dollars for Melba Moore to receive her star on the Walk of Fame. First, I think it's tragic that you have to pay for your own can star on the Walk of Fame. That is disgusting to me. I applaud the Cat Williams and thank you, Cat, because I surely ain't got the seventy-five thousand dollars to get that lady to get a star on the Walk of Fame, and that shows great character. We arrived. No in high style in a procession of three vintage Rolls Royces led by police escort. The cars carried the Pointer sisters, Fritz and Aaron and my mother. Estranged sister Bonnie came along for the ride. Bonnie, where the fuck you been? Where the hell you been all, all fucking book? Though it wasn't my or Anita's idea to invite her, 
At the time, Bonnie was drinking and drugging. At the time, Bonnie was drinking and drugging it up big time. And the last thing we wanted was for any untoward behavior to detract from the occasion. It was June who pulled Bonnie into the picture at the last minute. The ride in the rolls to the celebration was awkward, but we gritted our teeth and politely kept our mouths shut. The crowd erupted in cheers as the Pointer Sisters decked out in eye-catching nostalgia threads, a nod to our musical roots, as well as our next big career move, starring in a traveling production of the Broadway classic. A misbehaving pranced through an aisle of cheerleaders onto the stage on Hollywood Boulevard. It was a wonderful event and would have been even better had June not been drunk. She was of the mindset that this was a celebration and celebration meant party time. After the unveiling, we headed to the House of Blues on Sunset Boulevard where they hosted a reception for us and we previewed a song from misbehaving. Bonnie was wasted by then and hinted that she wanted to get back in the group. When June started lobbying on Bonnie's behalf, the vibe got weird and very strained. We had been a trio for so long and much as it pained me to say this, Bonnie no longer fit the musical mode of the group. Anita and Mike and I got very uncomfortable with Bonnie around. After visiting with my mother and a few friends, we cut our night short and quietly left. How can you be uncomfortable with your sister? I mean, girl, listen, everybody's sister or brother get on their nerves. Siblings can get on your nerves, baby. You hear me? When you just die, I don't fuck with that. He didn't, I mean, you didn't try, you didn't put forth your best effort, you didn't did your due diligence to try to keep the relationship at a cordial point. But feeling uncomfortable with somebody who you shared a bed with is absolutely ridiculous to me. June's behavior was really starting to concern me, especially when I thought about our upcoming tour of duty in Ain't Misbehaving. We had signed on for a year long commitment requiring eight performances a week. I knew Anita and I were up to the physical demands that would impose on us, but June was a big question mark. A touring production of Ain't Misbehaving would revive the popular 1978 play based on 35 songs by Thomas Fats Waller, the Tin Pan Alley Master, whose jazzy swinging torch songs captured the sounds of black musicians of the 1920s and 30s who ignited the Harlem Renaissance. The musical review captures the excitement of the Cotton Club, Savoy Ballroom, and Lenox Avenue dives and honky tonks that were the playgrounds of high society. The beloved original Broadway production starring Irene Cara and Nell Carter ran for four years to loud cheese. You know, I knew Nell Carter was a huge part of it, but what I didn't know was that Irene Kerr was a part of the production. I never knew In that. In the beginning, it was a new and thrilling adventure. The investors were very generous and everything was first class. They brought us to the Big Apple to experience what it felt like to be real Broadway artists. We were put up in the Pierre Hotel on 61st Street near Rockefeller Center. I loved the hustle and the bustle of the city, getting picked up in a town car and listening to my favorite R&B stations on the ride to the rehearsal hall. We'd hear the tickling of the pianos and actors rehearsing their lines and see dancers stretching their limbs. You couldn't help but be excited in this type of environment. That special feeling lasted all of one week after we took Ain't Misbehaving on the road. Ain't Misbehaving ran for 48 weeks and June missed 211 performances, approximately 30 weeks. Most of her absences were a result of drug binges, 
But on one occasion, she was knocked out of commission by Jeffrey Bowen, Bonnie's punk ass husband. Huh? It happened at a Christmas Eve party at June's house. Everything was fine until Jeffrey told Bonnie it was time for them to leave. Bonnie didn't want to go. They ended up in a scuffle, and when June intervened, Jeffrey broke her nose and sprained one of her fingers. How the f does that happen when you in my house? A house full of siblings. How does that happen? How does I wish, I wish somebody would raise their voice at me in my family's house? The nigga wouldn't make it out the door. Now he would make it to the basement. If you know what I mean. But he wouldn't make it out the door. I said possibly. They ended up in a scuffle. And when June intervened, Jeffrey broke her nose and sprained one of her fingers. Despite her slight build, June was no one to mess with. She had a temper and wasn't one to back down. June grabbed the nearest thing she could find an ice bucket, and cracked Jerry over the head, knocking him out. Glory! Some baby girls, that's what I be talking about. They don't give a shit. They ready to fight. That's what I like about them crazed, insane mother head When he came to the police, hauled his ass to jail. When he bailed out, he and Bonnie went right to the National Enquirer to tell them their side of the story, that Bonnie broke her own nose with the ice bucket. In court, it was a different story. In front of a judge, Jeffrey cried like a bit, blamed his behavior on alcohol and cocaine and begged for forgiveness. He was sentenced to three years probation, eight months of community service, and a year of domestic abuse counseling, and ordered to attend two narcotics anonymous meetings a week for 13 weeks, and find $2,000 in a development about as surprising as night following day. A few weeks later, Jeffrey violated his parole and was packed off to jail for 60 days. June ended up missing almost a month of performances due to the injury. June ended up missing almost a month of performances due to the injury. Her understudy, Wendy Edney ended up making more money than June because she had to fill in so many times for my AWOL sister. Remember when Nell Carter caught grief in the press for missing a record 100 plus performances? June put that record to shame. It was such a pity because June had the best part and the biggest dance number in the play. She would never fail to blow us all away when she put her mind to it. But that just didn't happen very often. As the ape misbehaving tour limped on, we dealt not only with mixed reviews, tepid audiences, and few sold out shows, but I was missing my husband and children, something fierce. June wasn't much for looking at things from our standpoint. And I don't think she understood how much her behavior was hurting our reputation with promoters. Believe it or not, her spotty attendance record after Ain't Misbehaving grew even worse. It seemed as if all she wanted to do was stay in bed all day and smoke crack. Damn, June. One time when we sent someone to June's house to wake her and bring her to the show, he was robbed at gunpoint by a thug inside the house. June was definitely hanging with a different crowd by this point. We had a private gig in Malibu for an important client and June didn't show when she was supposed to. Gangbangers, druggies, and other hanger-on moved into June's house. So did Bonnie and Jeffrey Bowen. They commandeered the master bedroom for themselves. The house was steadily stripped of everything of value, including beautiful artifacts and antiques, expensive toys, and the contents of June's home recording studio. All her money went into a crack pipe, and there were problems keeping her water and electricity turned on. Neighbors complained about the noise and illegal activity going on in the house 24-7. 
Cash and sexual favors were traded for drugs. Cars pulled up and left at all hours and low lives ran rampant in the neighborhood. A drug lab was set up in the house to supply everyone with the poison that had taken over their lives. One of the few times June actually made a pointer sister show a young woman overdosed and died in her basement. A story about that was one of several about June that appeared in the National Enquirer. Girl, don't nobody take that shit for serious. That's the National Enquirer. Didn't they get sued like one gazillion times? Ain't they the same niggas that talk about the aliens in the White House? Girl, don't nobody pay no attention to no damn National Enquirer. June also blew off an appearance on Vicky, hosted by our longtime friend, Vicky Lawrence. We went way back with her to our first time on The Carol Burnett Show. Vicky and Carol were not only talented artists, but they were real down-to-earth people. They were genuine, kind, and loyal folks. It was a new talk show for Vicky, and she specifically requested us because it was her birthday. We loved Vicky, and we wanted to show our loyalty in return. Anita and I showed up at the studio for the taping, but not June. We grew alarmed and called June repeatedly, but she didn't answer the phone. I'd never seen Vicky upset before, but she sure was now. And our disappointment morphed into anger at June as well. That's when we decided it was time for a full-blown intervention. Mommy, you say that you love me. 